wonderful music. Welcome to our Women's Sunday. Yes. We used to be called United Methodist Women. We're now called United Women in Faith. And we started in the 1800s when women didn't have any power to do anything. And they formed a group to help women and children and youth. And we've carried on doing that all these many years. And so today we have a wonderful program that we hope will be inspiring and informative. And we bring you the joy of women across the ages and ask that you open your heart to them. And right now, let's open our heart to one another as we say good morning and may the peace of the Lord be with you. Him. Marlene? Him. <laughs> opening him. Please join us in this morning's opening hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Words on the screen. All things bright and beautiful. That includes you. <laughs> together, we gather together today to celebrate that God reaches out to us. God reaches out to me. We gather today to celebrate women across history who listened to God and had courage to follow God's leading. I promise to listen to God more carefully every day and have the courage to follow God's leading. We come as God's people, open and teachable. Here I am, Lord. I am yours. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and Pastor Rick wants to do the announcements. He's an honorary United Women of Faith. Good morning. It is a joy to be here, and, and it's a unique perspective. I shared that with uh, Dan just a moment ago, to be out opening the door and uh, welcoming all of you. Because when uh, Marlene invited us to greet one another, I said, who haven't I greeted yet? Uh, and it was, a, it was a joy to be able to do that, to stand there. So uh, I would invite any of you to take the opportunity from time to time to say, hey, I'll greet at the door and open the door. And, you'll get a chance to say hi to everyone that, that comes in. I want to share with you with the, the announcements that are happening and uh, coming up. Uh, Ash Wednesday is coming, the beginning of our Lenten season. 
a time of preparation, a time for spiritual discipline as we walk the journey with Christ as he comes to the end of his physical life, but also to the celebration of the resurrection. So I invite you on Ash Wednesday, two opportunities, anytime between uh, 8 and 9 in the morning on Wednesday the 22nd or 6 to 7 in the evening to come to meditate, to pray, to receive the ashes. There will be some devotional material that will be here or bring your own and be in a time of prayer and contemplation. So we invite you to come and be a part of that. Want to invite you, there's a sign up on the table as you came in where I was standing opening the door, uh, that there are sign ups that are out on that table, and one of them is for the Valentine's breakfast that is happening next Saturday. Uh, so we want to make sure we know how many to prepare for. Uh, again, ladies are free. Uh, and the gentleman is $10, so uh, you just pay at the door, but we do want you to sign up so we know that you'll be here. It's always a good time to fellowship and, and have fun. Want to uh, make sure next Sunday is the Bell Trio concert over at Grace Presbyterian. There is an insert in your bulletin about that and about who is going to be presenting this wonderful concert. It is our folks that are doing it. We are sponsoring it. I will be emceeing. Um, if you want to help in handing out programs and, and you plan on going, let me know, and uh, that way we can plan accordingly for, for that. But it's going to be a wonderful concert. This trio has already played around town and here as well, and we look forward to them gracing next uh, Sunday, but also uh, in the future here uh, at Temecula. I want to share with you about a new uh, group that is happening that you actually are invited to be a part of starting on March 2nd. We uh, are moving out and moving forward. You read about our, our uh, mission statement. It's on, in the bulletin how we are uh, an accepting and affirming, reconciling congregation. Um, but we have a, a group that is forming uh, called Amplify. These wonderful people are coming together. Uh, they are parents of uh, children who are part of the LBGTQ uh, plus uh, community and family. And uh, they have started by studying, but they needed a place to come to find support and to be able to offer support. So they are beginning on uh, March 2nd at 6.30. They'll meet every Thursday at 6.30, uh, some of the weeks. Uh, will be support, and some of the weeks will be where they will study some, some books and literature to help those families in which their uh, children and family members are uh, coming out and sharing about their life. So we invite you to pray for this group. We invite you if you'd like to come and be a part of it or how you might want to support uh, this group as well. You can see me. I also want to share with you an opportunity, uh, the gentleman here in this one uh, slide photo, uh, Mark Turner and his wife Donna are good friends of mine, and uh, uh, we have been working together on certain projects. Mark and Donna have been part of an uh, um, organization that they founded and that they run, Horizon Gate Ministries, and uh, they do arts in so many different forms, from paintings to poetry. Uh, to uh, drama, and they are going to come and do a workshop uh, on how to make the scriptures come alive in worship or in other settings, and that's going to be on March 18th. I think, again, there's an insert in your bulletin that you can read about it. Um, it'll be a wonderful day, and then that Sunday on the 19th, we're going to do something a little bit different in worship where we are going to present the feeding of the 5,000, and you will represent the 5,000. So if you want to get closer to that number, invite your friends to come. Uh, I don't think we'll get 5,000 in this room, but who knows? Jesus did a miracle with bread and fish. He might be able to do a miracle with space as well. So uh, invite your friends to that. It'll be a wonderful weekend of learning and growing in the Word. So I invite you to be a part of it. And then I just want to share with you to put on the calendar the tea. Uh, it is coming back uh, under the leadership of Megan Adesso. Uh, she will have sign up starting next week, but put the date on your calendar, and it's going to be an afternoon tea. So you want to plan accordingly. It'll be a great uh, time. There'll be some 
some uh, sharings and opportunities as well, but the, the idea is to have fellowship and fun and enjoy the good eats that are going to happen as well. So we invite you to be a part of that as well. This is the time where we bless our quilts. For those of you who aren't, have been around here before, we have a prayer quilt ministry called Prayers and Squares. And if you have someone in your life that is in need of prayer, you can request a quilt. They're free. Uh, we meet the second and fourth Fridays in the mornings. This week, we have a request for Art Salyer's brother, Chuck, who is uh, working on shoulder reconstruction and having a challenge over that. And he would like our prayers. So what you, we ask you to do is after church, they'll be hanging up outside under the tower. Please go tie knots and say a little prayer, even if it's just God bless you. We get wonderful letters and emails from people who say they just feel these quilts filled with prayer and it's really helpful to them. And this is a friend of Gilbert's and mine, Sonia, who is going through some rough times in her life. And we would like to offer her encouragement and lifting and comfort. And so let's just take a moment and say thank you, God, for calling us together in this time and this place. For remembering that you are always with us. And remembering that your love and your light and your healing power saturate all that is. And we lift up Chuck and Sonia into that light of yours and ask for them to be healed and raised and comforted and blessed. And we ask that our prayers go with them, with these quilts, that they feel our care and our love and they feel God's presence as they wrap themselves in these visible signs of God's love. And so we rejoice in the opportunity to share these quilts, to share this love, to share these prayers. And we release this prayer Sealing it in the name of Christ. Amen. So now we have our candles, and we light the first one in peace, which, as many of you know, has been my life work and dream and caused me to travel all over the world trying to build bridges between people. And right now it seems that there are a lot of crazy people in charge who don't want peace, and I know that the spark, the light of God is in them, even in the evil actors in the world, even in Putin. And somehow or other, that miracle of the 5,000, the miracle of Lazarus, can crack that seed of God's light inside of his heart, and he could repent. And so I pray for that. We also pray for all those sick with and recovering from COVID and all the various diseases running around right now that the healing power of God lifts them and comforts them. And I would like to pray for something I found out about today in Ashbury College in Kentucky. There are thousands of young people from all over the world who have been praying for over 10 days. And people are coming from as far away as Singapore. And other colleges are now starting. There's a half a dozen more colleges. Around the clock prayer. And I just think that I would like us to join those prayers, those dedicated young people, the people who we thought didn't care about God, are spending 10 days of their life and haven't stopped and are continuing to pray for God's love and light. And I found out that this is a Wesleyan-oriented college that started it in Ashbury, part of the Methodist holiness movement. So... Are there any requests for prayers on this side of the room? And if there are, please talk nice and loud. <laughs> okay, over here, anybody? Rick?
And also, one of our cast members, Barbara Gaborko, got ill, and so we have Penny Wagner substituting for her. So we want to say a prayer for Barbara. Yes? Oh, wow, yeah. Yesterday, they pulled out two more people alive. It's amazing. Okay, over here? Yes. What's his name? Kevin? Devin. Okay. Devin. Okay. Oh, we light a candle. <laughs> Anybody over here? Okay, now we're going to do something a little different today. At the end of our prayer, our wonderful Jean is going to sing the Lord's Prayer. And so I ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer and open your heart to hear that prayer that we say every week and maybe even more often to hear it deepen your heart in maybe a new way. So let's just let go of everything, whatever it took to get here or whatever is going on in your life and bring ourselves into this now moment, into this one place where we can live and move and have our being and remember that's how we live in God, that we are always at one, we are never separate, that all we have to do is to turn to that divine presence that is with us. And we remember that we are made in the image and likeness of God, that we are God's children, that we are all part of one family, the human family, and that we are all beloved in the same way by that presence that has created us. And in that knowing that we can trust God and God's love, we bring all these prayers into this moment for peace, for the cracking open of the hearts of the evildoers in the world, that they may awaken and remember who they are and what God wants them to do. And for those who are ill, that they rise with the power of God's healing energy surging through them, bathing every molecule and atom and organ of their being, restoring them to the perfect image of God's creation. For everyone who is in pain or anguish, feeling lost or lonely, we ask that their hearts open to the presence of God that loves them, that they turn and heal and flower and blossom and unfold into this world. I declare that God's kingdom can come to this planet through us, and we join in prayer with the thousands of young people right now praying around the clock, days on end. And we lift our prayer with those who care and see and know that the answer to all of these problems is in our God, the loving presence that we have come to know and care for and serve. We lift this prayer up and we let it go because we know the perfect work is done in God, not in us. And we seal it with the ancient seal of faith as we say, Amen.
to temptation but deliver You brought tears to my eyes, Jean. That song, my whole life has been about spiritual growth. And that song, those words, have such profound meaning when we listen to them. When I was preparing for this, our extravaganza this morning, I was looking for scriptures, and I found these spoke to me that I could imagine these eight women read and were inspired by to do the impossible things that they did. So they're scattered throughout the Old Testament. So first in Deuteronomy 31, be strong, take courage, don't be intimidated, don't give them a second thought, because God, your God, is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you. He won't let you down. He won't leave you. In Psalms 27, light, space, zest, that's God. So with him on my side, I am fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. And in Proverbs, you're blessed when you meet Lady Wisdom, when you make friends with Madam Insight, she's worth far more than money in the bank. Her friendship is better than a big salary. Her value exceeds all the trappings of wealth. Nothing you could wish for holds a candle to her. With one hand, she gives long life. With the other, she confers recognition. Her manner is beautiful. Her life is wonderfully complete. She's the very tree of life to those who embrace her. Hold her tight and be blessed. The word of God. So we have eight women who have traveled across history from the 400s to the early 20th century to be with you this morning. And... These are all women who have touched my life, my journey, informed me in various ways as I work to grow and unfold spiritually. And so I'm hoping and praying that this morning, one or more of them will touch your heart and you'll want to explore them and read their words and let them touch you. Be a soul friend to you, as Zen is, Bridget is going to say in a moment, that concept, the Celts came up with the concept of soul friend that you need to have a soul friend in this life and beyond to grow spiritually. And so these eight women are my soul friends, and I hope some of them will be adopted by you. So let us begin with Bridget of Kildare. It is my honor to be considered as one of the three patron saints of Ireland. Both St. Columbo and I were born in Ireland, while Patrick was not. I was born in 452 and died in 524. Some call me the Mary of the Gales. I was a daughter of a Christian slave woman and a Druid priest. I was named after the pre-Christian goddess Bridget and tried to bring together both sides of my heritage during my life. I founded Kildare, the Church of the Oak, in 490, 
on a generous land grant from the King of Leinster. It was a double monastery with both women and men living there, and I presided over both. I led the monastery to be a remarkable house of learning for men and women. The famous Book of Kildare, an illuminated manuscript that was highly praised as one of the finest of all illuminated manuscripts, was created at Kildare. It sadly disappeared in the future for you three centuries ago. They say my generosity was legendary, probably related to my belief that the needs of the body and the needs of the spirit were intertwined. Because of my compassion and generosity, I was led to care for the needy. Kildare is renowned for exhibiting Christ's love for the poor. I participated in several ecumenical councils of Ireland, and I was able to influence the policies of the Church of Ireland to a great extent. Some accounts say I was adorned as I was ordained as a bishop, yet I was able to remain a humble person, tending to cattle and doing hard work. I preached to the Druids, healed the lepers, the blind, and children. I insisted it was essential to have a soul friend. My soul friend was Darlada. Our souls are so closely aligned that Darlada died exactly one year after me, as I had predicted. I believe that having a true soul friend helps us to know God's presence in our lives. This idea is partially based on a sense that Christ is in a friendship with us. I said, anyone without a soul friend is like a body without a head. From the time of my death for a thousand for a thousand years, a perpetual fire was kept burning by the nuns at Kildare in my honor. It was said to have been extinguished at the time of the Reformation. This is a traditional Celtic prayer to have me as a soul friend in the cloud of witnesses. I am under the shielding of Bridget each day. I am under the shielding of good Bridget each night. I am under the keeping of the nurse of Mary each early and late every dark, every light. Bridget is my comrade woman. Bridget is my maker of song. Bridget is my helping woman, my choicest of women, my guide. Thank you, Bridget. Our next person is the very first mi women mystic I ever read when I was studying for the ministry, Mechtild of Magdeburg. I'm want you to listen to her carefully. She has a lot of wonderful things to share. I have to get my prop. There we go. Feels like home. <laughs> It is said, my ideas are inspiring in their own right. You might find they are all the more amazing. Considering I was, considering the era in which I lived was 1207 to 1282. Oh, wait, maybe 1290. I know I was quite old when I died. During my lifetime, it was very challenging for women. Mostly, we were not taken seriously. It was a time which women's voices were mostly lost in the midst of time. I was born in a castle of noble Saxon family. I joined the medieval poverty movement at the age of 20 and chose to leave the castle. My family was not very happy. I chose to live in the city. I had my first, first vision of the Holy Spirit when I was 12 and many more over the years. I chose poverty and lived and worked for 40 years as it began in Magdeburg. I became a Dominion Toshiri and was encouraged to write down my visions, which became my book. Even up to today, I am famous for my book, the, Fall, the Flowing Light of the Godhead, that I wrote in Middle Low German, the language of the poor. I was the first mystic to write in German. In those days, the texts were written in Latin. 
my writings unite bridal mysticism of the Song of Songs in the Old Testament with poetry of the love lyrics, creating a new poetry which reveals my experience of God. My criticism of the church dignitaries and my theological insight aroused so much opposition that some called for the burning of my writings. With advancing age, I was not only isolated and the object of extensive criticism, but I also became blind. Around 1272, I joined the Cistercian nunnery to which offered me protection and support. I finished writing down many divine revelations. The nuns were highly educated and important works of my mysticism survived from my own younger contemporaries such as St. Gertrude the Great. My works were mostly lost by the 15th century but rediscovered in the 19th century. I was considered a saint and remembered by the Catholic and Church of England. November 19th, each year is my day. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> The next person is Hildegard of Bingham, I think one of the most amazing women that ever lived because of the wide array of things she was superb in. And she's been an amazing inspiration to my life. So Hildegard, would you come share with us? I was born 1098 and died 1179 in the Rhine area of Germany. I was one of 10 children. I entered a convent at the young age of eight. It is often said that my life was truly extraordinary, partly because I did a number of things that women could not do in my time and for centuries to come. Some have called me one of the greatest mystics of the ages. I am called saint and doctor of the church. In 1150, I founded my own convent where I lived until my death in 1179. I often communicated with popes and emperors, sometimes scolding them. I was involved in politics and diplomacy during a time of conflict in my region. I also preached throughout Germany. <clears throat> I was a writer of spiritual works, an artist, especially mandalas expert in healing herbs, a natural scientist, and a prolific composer and innovator in sacred music. There are more surviving chants of mine than of any other composer from the entire Middle Ages. And I am one of the few known composers to have written both the music and the words. People traveled from far and wide to study with me. Let me share a few things from my writings. God is good, and all things which proceed from him are good. The fire has its flame and praises God. The wind blows the flame and praises God. In the voice we hear the word which praises God. In the word, when heard, praises God. So all of creation is a song of praise to God. God hugs you. You are encircled by the arms of the mystery of God. Humankind, full of all creative possibilities, is God's work. Humankind alone is called to assist God. Humankind is called to co-create. With nature's help, humankind can set into creation all that is necessary and life-sustaining. We cannot live in a world that is interpreted for us by others. An interpreted world is not a hope. Part of the terror is to take back our own listening to use our own voice to see our own light. Thank you, Hildegard. And now Julian of Norwich, who was the first woman to write in the English language, is going to come and share some of her brilliance with us. So 
those stairs get steeper every year. <clears throat> I am Julian, Julian of Norwich. I live 1342 to 1416. I was an English anchoress who lived in the city of Norwich, a busy city, a center of commerce with a vibrant spiritual life. I am known as an important Christian mystic and theologian. My revelations of divine love, written around 1395, is the first book in the English language known to have been written by a woman. I was also known as a spiritual authority within my community, where I also served as a counselor and an advisor. I am venerated in the Anglican, Catholic, and Lutheran churches as a saint. During my lifetime, the city suffered the devastating effects of the Black Death of 1348 to 1350, the Peasants' Revolt, which affected large parts of England in 1381, and the suppression of the Lollards. In 1373, when I was 30, I was so seriously ill that I thought I was on my deathbed. At that time, I received a series of visions or showings of the Passion of Christ. I recovered from my illness and wrote two versions of my experiences, the earlier one being completed soon after my recovery. A much longer version, today known as the Long Text, was written many years later. Here are a few samples of what I wrote. The greatest honor we can give Almighty God is to live gladly because of the knowledge of his love. See that I am God. See that I am in everything. See that I do everything. See that I have never stopped ordering my works nor ever shall eternally. See that I lead everything on to the conclusion I ordained for it before time began. By the same power, wisdom, and love with which I made it. How can anything be amiss? And in this, he showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, as it seemed, and it was as round as any ball. I looked upon it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? And it was, an, and it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how it might last, for I thought it might suddenly have fallen to nothing for littleness, and I was answered in my understanding. It lasts and ever shall, for God loves it. And so have all things their beginning by the love of God. In this little thing, I saw three properties. The first is that God made it, the second, that God loves it, and the third, that God keeps it. All will be well, and all manner of things will be well. It is the ability to see, stay in alignment with, and celebrate what God is doing in the world and how his kingdom is moving forward, even in less than ideal circumstances. Thank you, Julian. And now we're going to France to Jean-Marie Guan, who was in prison for teaching some of the things we teach. I lived from 1648 to 1717 in France. My parents were wealthy, so I had a comfortable early life. At 15, I was forced into an arranged marriage with an older man and suffered greatly at the hands of my mother-in-law and servants. Widowhood at 28 came as a blessing. I am considered a French mystic, even though I was accused of advocating quietism, which was considered heretical by the Roman Catholic Church. I was imprisoned from 1695 to 1703 after publishing the book, A Short and Very Easy Method of Prayer. In fact, I wrote several books on spirituality after I was widowed. It seems I created quite a controversy, a woman of all things trying to teach men. I faced the extreme prejudices against women of my day. I even attempted to get Louis XIV to live by my precepts. 
One of my great achievements was being a teacher of spirituality. One of my disciples was Fenelon, who became an important writer and theologian. He was able to carry my ideas to many ears. In presenting spiritual life as a process in stages of increasing detachment and surrender to divine providence, I was able to stay within a tradition that runs from the Greek fathers to the present age. Some of my ideas were similar to St. Teresa's description of the upper mansions in the interior castle. I stress the importance of Lecto Divina, divine reading. Here is one of my instructions. There are two means by which we may be led into the higher forms of prayer. One is meditation and the other meditative reading. By meditative reading, I mean the taking of some truths, either doctrinal or practical, the latter rather than the former, and reading them in this way. Take the truth which has presented itself to you and read two or three lines, seeking to enter into the full meaning of the words, and go on no farther as long as you find satisfaction in them. Leave the place only when it becomes insipid. After that, take another passage and do the same, not reading more than half a page at once. It is not so much from the amount of reading that we derive profit as the manner of reading. Thank you, Jean-Marie. We have, as you see, women who've overcome supposedly obstacles that couldn't be overcome. And Sojourner Truth is certainly someone closer to our time who did that. And she's going to tell us her story. I lived from 1797 to 1883. Even though I was a former slave, I was able to become an outspoken advocate for abolition, temperance, and civil women's rights in the 19th century. I even received an invitation to meet President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. I was born Isabella Bumfrey, a slave in Dutch-speaking Ulster County, New York, in 1797. I was bought and sold four times and subjected to harsh, harsh physical labor and violent punishments. In my teens, I was united with another slave with whom I had five children, beginning in 1815. In 1827, a year before New York's law, freeing slaves was to take effect, I ran away with my baby, Sophia, to a nearby abolitionist family, the Van Wagoners. This amazing family bought my freedom for $20, imagine that, and helped me successfully sue for the return of my five-year-old son, Peter, who was illegally sold into slavery in Alabama. I moved to New York City in 1828, where I worked for a local minister. By the early 1830s, I was honored to be able to participate in the religious revivals that were sweeping the state. And they say I became a charismatic speaker. In 1843, I declared that the Spirit called on me to preach the truth. And I renamed myself Sojourner Truth. As an itinerant preacher, I met abolitionist William Lord Garrison and Frederick Douglass. Garrison's anti-slavery organization encouraged me to give speeches about the evils of slavery. Unfortunately, I never learned to read or write. 
But in 1850, I was able to dictate what would become my autobiography. The narrative of, Sir, of Sojourner Truth to Olive Gilbert, who assisted in its publication. I was able to survive on sales of the book, which also brought me national recognition. I met women's rights activists, including Elizabeth Cady Staten and Susan B. Anthony, as well as temperance advocates, both causes I quickly championed. In 1851, I began a lecture tour that included a women's rights conference in Akron, Ohio, where I delivered my Ain't I a Woman speech, which became famous. In it, I challenged prevailing notions of racial and gender inferiority and inequality by reminding listeners of my combined strength. I was nearly six feet tall and female status. I ultimately split with Douglas, who believed suffrage for formerly enslaved men should come <clears throat> before women's suffrage. I thought both should occur simultaneously. During the 1850s, I settled in Battle Creek, Michigan, where three of my daughters lived. I continued speaking nationally and helped slaves escape to freedom via the Underground Railroad. When the Civil War started, I urged young men to join the Union cause and organized supplies for black troops. After the war, I was honored with an invitation to the White House and became involved with the Freedmen's Bureau, helping freed slaves find jobs and build new lives. While in Washington, D.C., I lobbied against segregation, and in the mid-1860s, when a streetcar conductor tried to violently block me from riding, I ensured his arrest and won my subsequent case. In the late 1860s, I collected thousands of signatures on a petition to provide former slaves with land, though Congress never took action. Nearly blind and deaf towards the end of my life, I spent my final years in Michigan. One of the things I often said was, and if God is all in all, and worketh all in all, as I have heard them read, then it's impossible he should rest at all. For if he did, every other thing would stop and rest too. The waters would not flow, and the fishes could not swim, and all motion must cease. Thank you, Sojourner. And now we have Nona Brooks, who's dear to my personal journey because I served for a number of years in the church she founded in the late 1800s in Colorado. And so, Nona Brooks. I guess I'm okay. She's a hard act to follow. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm Nona Brooks. I lived from 1861 to 1945 in Kentucky, but we moved to Pueblo, Colorado after my father's business collapsed. In 1890, with the aim of becoming a teacher, I enrolled at Pueblo Normal School, which was followed by a one-year stay at Wellesley College. In 1887, encouraged by my sisters, I attended classes taught by Kate Bingham, student of Emma Curtis Hopkins. While attending these classes, I found myself healed of a persistent throat infection 
that it made it impossible for me to swallow food. Shortly after, we began teaching and healing. In December 1898, I was ordained by Melinda Kramer as a minister in the Church of Divine Science and founded the Denver Divine Science College. Shortly after, thereafter, I inaugurated the Divine Science Church of Denver and in the process became the first woman pastor in Denver. I also served on several Denver civic boards, including the Colorado State Prison Board. I traveled to Australia, lecturing and establishing churches. I have been called the prophet of modern mysticism. To give you an idea of my teachings, here are quotes from my book, Mysteries. There must be a religious experience. This is fundamental in all worthwhile living. If humankind is persistent and true to the vision of oneness, there comes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the basic experience, and without it, life is cold and mechanical. Hold to your philosophy. Train your thinking. But think and act so that the great religious experience of, I'm sorry, the great religious experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit will come on you. As we live faithfully to the divine trust and practice, steadfast, and practice steadfastly, persistently and consistently, consistently, the presence of God in our daily experiences and in our thinking, we come to the great moment in which the Holy Spirit descends on us as it did on those of old. Our lives are transformed. In, what, in that great moment, we are fully conscious of God's presence. We stand in the realization of this consciousness. Life is manifestly wonderful, glorious, free, and rich every day and all days. Jesus applied the principle of unity in every experience of the day. He blessed not only those whom he touched in person, but he is blessing the world after nearly 2,000 years. Jesus taught us that in the consciousness of God, we can do all things. Keep the faith. Be consistent. Practice integrity. Keep up the simple practice of affirming the presence moment by moment. Thank you, Nona. And finally, we have Evelyn Underhill. Her book, Mysticism, was one that I had to study when I was studying for the ministry. And she's going to share with you. I'm Evelyn Underhill. I lived 1875 to 1941. I was an English Anglo Catholic writer and pacifist known for my numerous works on religion and spiritual practice, in particular, Christian mysticism. In the English-speaking world, I was one of the most widely read writers on such matters in the first half of the 20th century. No other book of its type until the appearance of, in 1946, after my death, I might add, of Aldous Huxley's The Perennial Philosophy met with such success to match that of my best-known work, Mysticism, published in 1911. My map of the way of Christ is divided into five stages. The first was awakening of self. I quoted Henry Susso, the disciple of Master Eckhart. I shared how Susso's description of the truth related to each soul's true nature and purpose once remembered contains the power of fulfillment, and it became the starting point of my own path. The second stage I presented was psychological purgation of self. We must cast all things from us and strip ourselves of them and refrain from claiming anything for our own. The third stage I entitled Illumination and quoted William Law, one of the mentors of the Wesley brothers. Everything in nature is descended out of that which is eternal and stands as a visible outbirth of it. And there we find it in its eternal state. The fourth stage I described as the dark night of the soul, which my correspondents show that I struggled with throughout my life wherein one is deprived of all that has been valuable to the lower self. And I quoted 
Mechthild of Magdeburg, since thou hast taken from me all that I had of thee, yet of thy grace leave me the gift which every dog has by nature, that of being true to thee in my distress, when I am deprived of all consolation. This I desire more fervently than thy heavenly kingdom. And last, I devoted a chapter to the unitive life, the sum of the mystic way. When love has carried us above all things into the divine dark, there we are transformed by the eternal word, who is the image of the Father. And as the air is penetrated by the sun, thus we receive in peace the incomprehensible light enfolding us and penetrating us. It is said that I struck new ground in my insistence that this state of union produced a glorious and fruitful creativeness so that the mystic who attains this final perfectness is the most active doer, not the reclusive dreaming lover of God. I would think you might like to thank this cast of women who's traveled centuries to be with you. I hope some of them, or all of them, touched your heart so that you'll go explore some of their writings and expand your spiritual journey. It's a time that we get to give our tithes and offerings. We have two plates. The wooden one is to supply this church with its needs for salaries and lights and gardeners and all the things that cost to be here today. And the second one is what we call the golden basket, and it's for re outreach in the world. In this particular case, it's for the food pantry. And we know that in these times, there's great need for supporting those who need extra food. And so we ask that you hold your offerings in your hand and place your blessing on them as we listen to Corey and as our ushers come forward. And we place our blessing, our love, our joy upon this offering. And we ask that God bless it and multiply it and bring back to us all of the abundance of good in this entire universe. And we just give thanks. We're able to give to the support of this spiritual work. And so it is. Amen.